Okay. Welcome to English Composition 3. I'm doing it this way so that you will have English subtitles at the bottom. Uh, so today uh, we will talk about what this course is, what we will be doing, and um, I will also talk a bit about our first unit. So this is the Moodle page. I have designed this course so that all the information you need is on this page. Uh, my email is here. If you click on my Moodle account or Moodle profile, it will give you a different email. The Moodle email doesn't work. Please send your email to this place. Then we have the Microsoft Teams code. Um, if for some reason you are not in the team for this class, you don't have to wait for the school to add you. You can use this code and add yourself if you need to use Teams. Then we have the syllabus. Um, you can look at this yourself. Uh, I will give you a better version of the schedule. Let's see, this is important. Suggestions for learning guidance. Work hard, participate in class, and you'll be fine. So no pressure. Textbook is this one. Uh, Longman Academic Writing Series, five essays to research papers. We will be using this for both semesters. Now, you don't have to buy one if you don't want to, because I have posted the uh, relevant unit information on Moodle, and I will show you later. Um, so let me do a very quick comparison contrast about whether you should buy the textbook. Uh, this semester, one of our units is comparison contrast. So this is also an example. So on the one hand, having a physical textbook is a good idea because if you need to take notes um, or if you want to do some of the practice questions, you don't need to find another piece of paper. Uh, it's all in the same book. It's very useful. Moreover, um, we will not have time to do all 10 units across the two semesters. So if you don't buy a textbook, uh, you won't be able to learn those units on your own, right? It's also a kind of self-study resource. So if you're interested in uh, improving your essay writing beyond what we teach or beyond what I teach, it's a good idea to buy the textbook. So those are the advantages. The disadvantages, first of all, it's kind of heavy. You want to try? Heavy, right? Kind of heavy. Secondly, there are 10 units, but across the two semesters, we will only be doing four from this textbook. Um, the other six units, um, I encourage if you buy the textbook to use as self-study. But if you do use self-study, uh, the textbook does not have answers to the practice questions. So if you do buy a textbook and you want to do the questions, uh, you will have to come to me for the answers, which are in this book. Um, or I can just tell you whether your answer is good or not. I don't really need this book. And then the final disadvantage is it costs 535. Um, so if you want to buy a copy, please tell me uh, in the break or after class, uh, and I will collect the number of textbooks and then we'll buy a textbook. But if you uh, are not interested, you don't really have to buy one. So that's the textbook. Grades. 
I'm sure you are very interested in this part. 20% of your final grade will be your participation in class. Throughout this semester, you will write three kinds of essays. Exposition essay, cause effect essay, and a comparison contrast essay. Each essay is worth 20%. I will only grade your final draft. Your first draft, your second draft, your third draft, I will not grade. I will mark, I will correct, I will give you feedback, but I will only give you a grade on your final draft. So in the middle, uh, this gives you a bit of flexibility. If like one week you have an emergency and you can't finish the draft, you have a little more time. Or um, if you're not sure what you want to write about, you can do a rough draft and write whatever you think of, and based on my feedback, uh, you can then improve your drafts until the final draft. And the last 20% are the final exam. The exam is a coordinated exam on the final week, week 18. And I will be grading that exam. Now, the course system only lets me put in three grades, right? Daily grade, midterm grade, and final grade. So the final grade is the final exam, no problem. But what about daily and midterm? Well, I have to input the midterm grades during the semester. So your exposition essay, the first essay, will be your midterm grade. The other two essays and the participation grade will be your daily grade. OK? OK, so this is the basic document about our course, but it doesn't really give us a lot of detailed information. So first, let's I'll show you Moodle first, and then finally uh, we will talk about the detailed schedule. So as I said, everything you need will be on this Moodle page. The first section is course information, syllabus, the detailed schedule, class emails. If I need to announce something to everybody, uh, and maybe some of you are not here and you didn't hear the announcement, um, or maybe this happens between classes and you need to know before the next class. I will post the announcement in the class email section. Moodle will then send an email to your school email account. Now, I know that some of you don't look at your school email account, so I will also post that information on the Microsoft Teams page. So, you know, at least once a week, either check here or check the Microsoft Teams, just in case. Um, although it would be much better if you pay attention to your school email. OK, the next two sections you cannot see. I have hidden these from you. Basically, at the end of the semester, I will input your daily grade, your participation grade here and your final exam grade here. I use Moodle to calculate your semester final grade. This also means that you can see uh, your grade. Let's see, where would you see that? Um, here, if you click on grades, you will be able to see your own grade. Currently, nobody has any grades, right? All empty but you should be able to see your own grade. This um, calculation is the raw numbers. So like each category is 20 points. So the final grade course total on the right hand side should simply be adding up all of the numbers on the left. Right? Very simple. You don't have to multiply. You don't have to change numbers. Just add everything up and that's your final grade. OK, so if you're 
worried that maybe you're not doing very well, you want to check how you're doing, you can look at the grades section of Moodle. OK, and then uh, in this section, I have posted two um, documents, two files that may help you. The first one is called Good English Writing. Um, two years ago, I was the judge for the MCU Literary Awards English Essay section. Last year also, but this was from two years ago. And um, the school asks the judges to write some like reflections. And so I used that opportunity to write about what I think is a good piece of English writing. And you could read this on your own if you have time. The basic idea is English emphasizes clear, straightforward sentences. Right? If you write in Chinese, uh, your Chinese teacher may have told you, oh, you have to do something special with the language. It has to look pretty. In English, we focus on clarity. Can you clearly present your ideas to let your reader quickly understand them. So if you're not sure how to say what you want to say, SVO, subject, verb, object, is the best choice. Um, so what makes a piece of English writing good is not the sentence level. It's the bigger structure level. What do you say first? What do you say next? What do you choose to put in? What do you choose to leave out? So on a basic sentence level, clear and straightforward. But on a bigger level, that's where you have to do the work. The next file is in Chinese. And uh, this is for uh, students who may not be clear about the idea of plagiarism. Plagiarism is stealing other people's ideas. What it means is you see an idea that somebody else has said or written, and you take that idea and you put it in your own work and you pretend that it's your own idea. It's stealing. In the university, ideas are very important. The whole reason uh, you get your diploma, be it Zhenshu, is because you have demonstrated that you have learned all of these ideas. So stealing ideas is like stealing grades. Stealing grades is like stealing a diploma. And stealing a diploma is like stealing a job because you need it to get a job. So don't do it. Um, the Chinese article goes into the history of plagiarism in China, actually. Um, how when Western ideas about science and technology first entered China, people were not very clear about this idea of stealing other people's ideas and how that slowly developed into the system that we have today. But for the purposes of this course, the rule is this. If you give me something that has stolen ideas, it doesn't have the it doesn't have to be that the entire thing is stolen. If it has stolen ideas, if it's a rough draft, I will not mark it. If it's a final draft, I will give you a zero. If you do find a good idea and you really want to put it into your essay, tell me where you got it. If you tell me that it's not your idea, you didn't steal it. So you don't have to think of everything yourself, but you do have to tell me which parts are yours and which parts are not yours. Is that clear? Good. So that's the course information section. Then there's a section for each unit. Each unit, the PowerPoint is from the textbook. Then I have provided an article that I think is a good example of this kind of essay. And we will talk about this article in class. 
And then you have the place to submit your final draft so that I can grade it. Uh, and then you have the time period when you can submit it and please only submit PDFs. So each unit is like this, right? PowerPoint, PD, uh, article, and then submission. Now, the comparison contrast unit is not from our textbook. I'm not sure why. Th we've been teaching this course this way for a few years, so I'm not sure who decided this. Uh, but the unit is taken from another textbook. And so the first file is from that other textbook. Otherwise, the other two things are the same. An example article and a submission space. That's it. That's the Moodle page. Do you have questions about this? Yes. OK, thank you. So the question is, if I'm discussing an essay that I want to write with a friend or a classmate and we have the same ideas, is that plagiarism, right? How should I deal with that? Right, or something you found elsewhere, right? So um, in this class, you can decide the topic for your own essay. I will not assign a topic to you. If you happen to write the same topic as someone else, that's fine. You, we can't all write different topics all the time. The part about plagiarism is the specific ideas and the specific language. So if, uh, for example, you come up with the same idea as your friend, if you use a different language to express that idea, then it's not plagiarism. But if you find the idea in something online or in a book, something that is already in the world, then you have to tell me where you found the idea. Is that clear? So the difference is, is can we find that idea somewhere else by ourselves? If we can find it, then you have to tell us where you found it. If it's just like you're talking with somebody and only you two know about it, then it's fine. OK, thank you. Uh, other questions? OK, uh, now I want to show you the detailed schedule. And this will give you a guideline to what we are going to do this semester. OK, first week introduction. We're doing that right now. Uh, next week. We will introduce the first unit. I will talk about how to write an exposition essay and we will read the example from the textbook. Week three, holiday, no class. Week four, we will read the example essay that I have posted on Moodle. Now, by that time, you should already have some idea of what you want to write about. And during week four, I will divide you into groups, around four people per group. In week five, I should say before week five, sometime in the week between four and five, 
you should exchange essays with your group members. So when you come to class on week five, you should have the essays of your group members. If you're four people in a group, you should have three essays and then your own essay. And on week five, I will give you time to discuss each person's essays with each other. Now, uh, I will explain this more during week four, but the basic idea is that there is no such thing as the perfect essay. There's no such thing as an objective standard for what is a good essay. And I'm just one person. The more people who read an essay and give you feedback, the more complete and clear your essay can be. So peer review is a way to get other people to give you feedback. Right? I'm just one person. I have my own preferences, biases, uh, values that maybe some of you uh, don't share. So with peer review, you can get a better idea of how good your essay is, how clear it is. Is it missing something? Um, because all of us are different. And all of us have something valuable to give to each other. So that's week five. Now, on week six, you will have to hand in the draft of your exposition essay. Now, when it says hand in, it means give me a paper copy. Paper. I like killing trees. OK. Uh, and I will spend that. It was a joke. I don't really like killing trees. Um, I will take one week to mark your essays. And on week seven, um, we will come here and I will ask you to discuss your essay with me one by one. So that's the conference. It's a one on one conference. Now, uh, in the meantime, during week six, we will begin the second unit, right? You come in, you hand in your first essay, and then we begin the second essay unit. So that's the basic pattern for each unit. Week eight, you will have to submit your first essay. When it says submit, it means upload to Moodle. Right, so hand in means give me a paper. Submit means upload to Moodle. Uh, and so that's how the semester will go, right? Unit uh, week eight is the example essay of the second unit. Week nine, no class, no midterm exam. Week 10 is the second peer review, the peer review for your second essay. Week 11, hand in your second essay and we will begin the third unit. Week 12 is the conference for the second essay. Week 13 is the example essay for the third unit and you have to hand in your uh, submit your second essay. Week 14 is the third peer review. Now, week 15, you should hand in your essay, but there's no next unit. So what will we do that day? Uh, we can watch a movie. Uh, and then week 16 conference. Week 17 is before the final exam, so I will prepare a mock exam, morning call, uh, to give you a sense of practice uh, to help you prepare for the final exam. Now, I won't have time to mark your mock exam. It's purely to give you confidence and so that you can examine your own results. Right, we all know this, right? When you take an exam, there is only a limited time. You feel a lot of pressure. Whatever you think of, you put on the page. But after the exam ends, and you get your exam back, then you can see all of the stupid mistakes you made, right? So week 17 is to give you a chance to see what kind of mistakes you might make and to help you prepare for the actual exam. Okay, so 
because of the structure of the schedule, right? Some weeks are switching between units. It might be a bit complicated. So I posted this document onto Moodle just so you're sure where we are in this semester at all times. Yes. I can't quite remember. Yeah, that's right. Why is September 19 a holiday? Let me let me check. Hang on. September. Oh, it's not a holiday. Why did I say it's a holiday? OK, I'll come up with a new schedule, but the basic structure of the course is like this. Thank you. Yeah, OK, uh, do we have other questions about the, the schedule? OK, so. I have basically finished talking about the course introduction. Is there something that is not clear or something you want to ask me about this course? OK, so as it says on the schedule, the first week is introduction to course, introduction to good writing. We talked about that and then a basic grammar review. Bum, bum, bum. So we'll have to talk about grammar now. Sorry. Sorry for you. I love grammar. I'm going to have a lot of fun talking about this. Hang on. I need a board. <gasps> oh no. How can I talk about grammar without a board? Who gave me this classroom? Okay, so um I guess we'll have to use the projector anyway. The thing is, this semester I'm teaching two sections of writing three. Both of them are in this classroom. Um, so however I teach grammar now, I'll have to do that in two hours again. Oh, this also means that if for some reason you can't make uh, you can't make it to this course, you can kind of sneak into the next course and it will be the same ideas. Right in uh, seventh and eighth periods. I think it's still cooling down. OK. Um, some other commercials, so uh, I, this semester I'm also offering a course called English debate. If you're interested in debating, if you're interested in making clear arguments and persuading other people. You're welcome to come join my class. It's Thursday, fifth and sixth periods. Please come because if we don't have enough students, the class will be closed. And I really want to teach debate. It's fun. It's very practical. We'll have lots of practice and uh, debating. Another commercial while we're waiting for the projector. Um, I'm also co-advising the Elite English Club. Uh, so if you don't have a club yet, you're welcome to join us Friday's fifth period. Uh, and we're, we're going to do lots of fun things in English and that can help you uh, give you some more opportunities to practice 
and maybe can help you prepare if you want to study abroad. Um, I'm co-advising with George Cao Ruirong, uh, and we're still discussing the details, but you're welcome to come. The first club meeting will be next Friday, and uh, the department will announce details soon. OK, so let's talk about grammar. The basic, I know you guys have taken like two uh, two semesters of grammar already, right? You guys are probably sick of grammar. Um, so this is just a very quick review. The first basic idea is that the basic sentence structure of English looks like this. So, oh, you can't see that. Hang on, I think I need to share the screen. Okay, yeah, so the basic structure of an English sentence looks like this. I'm sure you are familiar with three-fifths of this formula, right? Subject, verb, object. The fourth thing, the in English it's called a tilde, just a tilde, represents everything that is not a noun or a verb. So if you have a time or a place or a tool or a reason or a condition or a, uh, any of those other things, this is where it fits in the sentence naturally. In a natural uh, unmodified English sentence, it comes after everything else. This is the opposite of Chinese, right? In English, you would say, I went to have dinner with my friend at 5 p.m., right? I, subject, went, verb, to have dinner, dinner is the object, and then you have all of the other things, right? With my friend is a companion, and at 5 p.m. is a time. But in Chinese, you would say, you would put this in the opposite direction, right? 我跟我朋友在傍晚五点的时候去吃饭. So when you're thinking about how to write something in English, remember that English puts all of the extra information at the back of the sentence. If you want to move that information elsewhere, remember to add a comma. The comma has many different uses. In this example, the comma tells the reader that this information was not supposed to be here, right? The writer moved the information here for some reason. Maybe it's for emphasis. Maybe it's to make things clearer. But whatever reason, remember that there should be a comma here. So in English, if you wanted to say, with my friend at 5 p.m., I went to have dinner. After 5 p.m., you should have a comma. With my friend at 5 p.m., comma, I went, uh, I went to have dinner. So that's the basic structure of an English sentence. Um, now, when we talk about subjects, verbs, and objects, not every sentence has an object, right? If your verb doesn't need an object, you don't have to give one. Not every sentence has a subject. There are 35 people in this room. There's no subject in that sentence, right? There, yo, in Chinese. But every sentence will have a main verb cluster, 动词组. And I call it a verb cluster because it's not always just one word. But you will only have one main verb cluster. If your sentence, if you're writing a sentence and you write and you write and you realize that you now have two verb clusters, two main verb clusters in your sentence, 
something has gone wrong, you will need to cut your sentence into two halves because there will only be one. Now, if you need to cut your sentence in half, there are many different ways to do this. So let's say you have written a sentence that kind of looks like this. You feel like that it should be two sentences. But how do you, what's the proper grammar to use to cut these two into two different sentences? The most simple way. Uh, two sentences. But sometimes you want something that expresses the relation between the two sentences. There are five basic relations. None of them is a comma. If you join two complete sentences with each other, you cannot just use a simple comma. You have to add what kind of relation exists between these two sentences. If they go together, and. If they are in opposite directions, but. If you can only choose one. If the first one causes the second one. Cause effect, shen ying hou guo. If the first, if the second one causes the first one. Four. These are the five basic relations between the sentences. So if you use a comma, you have to use one of these five. But there's another way to connect two complete sentences. Uh, and I have to warn you, this is a bit dangerous. It might cause problems. If you use it in the wrong time and place, something might explode. Uh, the semicolon. This is one of the biggest headaches for native speakers of English. When do you use a semicolon? And the answer is you can use a semicolon to connect two complete sentences. That's it. I hear what you're thinking, but wait, what about the and, but, or so for? Like if, if this is so easy, why do we need all of that? And this is because a semicolon asks the reader to come up with the connection between the two sentences. It's more work for the reader. And remember, we just said that English prizes clarity and straightforwardness. If you're asking the reader to do work, there should be a good reason. And so really a good idea for when to use a semicolon is when the two sentences are related and they're connected, but it's not easy to express that connection using only one word. Sometimes you want to say something and you want to say something else, but the connection is not clear. You know it's connected, but you're not quite sure exactly how it's connected. Or maybe it's more than one kind of connection. For all of these complicated situations, you can use a semicolon. Now, the reason I say it's dangerous is because this is the only punctuation mark. Well, not really. This is only one of two punctuation marks in English where you can do this. You can use an infinite number of semicolons and it will be grammatically OK. Now, obviously, I don't think you should do this. Uh, it makes a sentence very long and it's asking the reader to do a lot of work. But for some limited situations, this is something that you might have to do. So you can keep that in mind. 
Uh, and by limited situations, I mean the deadline is in five minutes and you really don't have time to think about these connections. Uh, if you do this, I will tell you maybe you should use this connection, that connection, but it will not be wrong. So these are the basic ways of connecting two complete English sentences. One, don't connect them. Two, a comma plus a kind of relation. And three, semicolons. Do you have questions so far? OK. Um, so now let's move into. Well, I should give you one reminder. Remember when I said this includes all of the other stuff? This one includes all of the other stuff, right? Tool, time, place, companion, condition, reason. For example, if you say because, that's this. Because I went to my friend's house. Is this a complete sentence? If you think it's a complete sentence, please raise your hand. If you think it's not a complete sentence, please raise your hand. If you're almost falling asleep, please raise your hand. If you don't know where you put your hand, please raise your hand. OK, it's not a complete sentence because it begins with the word because. So everything you say after because is your reason. After you finish the reason, you still have to give us the sentence. Uh, another one of this kind of situation. If you say, for example, I am taking two classes on writing. Is this a complete sentence? Same reason it's not. When you say, for example, you're telling the reader this part is an example. It's not a sentence. It's just an example. So uh, for this kind of sentence, usually we would do this. This is the grammatical way to say, for example. OK, let's move on to. Nouns. Now, here's the thing about grammar that you probably did not know before. Uh, maybe your grammar teacher told you a noun is a person, place, thing or idea, something like that, right? And a verb is an action, something you do. That's not true. The definition of a noun is any word that you can put in the S position or the O position. The definition of a verb is any word that you can put in the V position. And so sometimes you will end up with some strange English sentences that look weird, but actually do make sense. In this sentence, I gifted the invite to him yesterday. What is the verb? Gifted. You're thinking, wait, isn't gift a noun? Not if you put it in the V position, then it becomes a verb. What is the direct object? Invite. Again, it looks like a verb, but if you put it in the O position, it becomes a noun. So if you're worried about, uh, you know, should I put a noun here or a verb here or what? Don't worry. The position in the sentence will make the decision for you. But when we do talk about nouns, usually it's good to come up with simple examples 
so that you don't get confused. So the first thing about nouns I want to talk about is the difference between countable and uncountable nouns. And again, the rule is this. If the noun, if, okay, let's, let's come up with a noun, car, good simple noun. If this word only appears with something in front of it, or something behind it, then it's a count noun. It can be a car, it can be my car. Um, you cannot simply say car. So the reverse is also true. If the word can only appear by itself, you cannot say a sand, you cannot say sands, then it's a non-count noun. But remember, grammatical definitions are not based on the word, it's based on how you use it. So for example, there are times when the word car can be uncountable. How do you go to school? By car. There's nothing in front of car. There's nothing behind car. This car is uncountable. Why? If we think about this philosophically, the difference between uh, the use of car as a count noun and as a non-count noun is when you're using it as a count noun, it's an object. You can see it, one car, two cars. When you're using it as a non-count noun, it is an idea. When you say you go to school by car, you're not saying by this car, by that car. You're saying using the idea of a car, I, that's how I get to school. Right? You're not saying any particular car, it's a general answer. And so when we think about the reverse, sand is non-count, but if you add an S, it becomes a more concrete idea. It's Samu. You can count, right? There's a desert here, there's a desert there. You can count these. Uh, so the basic idea so far is that grammar depends on how you use the word and not what the word itself is. Let's take a 10 minute break. Uh, if you have not yet signed in, please come to the front to sign in. Sorry? Oh, it's 
Okay, before we continue with the grammar review, uh, I want to mention one other thing. This class will be taught in English, which is a good thing for one very specific reason. I will be recording each lecture and I will be uploading it to YouTube. YouTube will automatically generate English subtitles and a transcript with Zhuzigao. As you can see here, these are some ways to open the subtitles, and this is how to open the transcript. Now you will see the transcript will appear on the right hand side of your screen. It is on the screen, which means you can search the transcript. If you remember I said something, something, but you don't remember when I said it, you can search for it and you can click on that line and it will take you to that place in the video. This is something that you cannot do if this class is taught in Chinese because YouTube does not generate automatic Chinese subtitles, only English. So if you need to review a lecture, uh, you don't have to watch the whole thing. You can jump to where you need to review. Uh, and this file has been posted to Moodle here. Subtitles and tra transcript on YouTube. OK, where were we? Nouns. So we talked about countable nouns and uncountable nouns. But so far, I have not mentioned one key idea, which many students, especially in Taiwan, have trouble with. I'm talking about this word, the. When do you use this word? What does it mean? First of all, it's very important to remember the has nothing to do with if a noun is countable or non-countable. There's no relation. You can add the to cars, you can add the to sand, you can add the to any noun. So what does it mean? When do we use it? It's kind of like the Chinese word mo, or in English we would say some or a certain. It's a, it's a kind of frame that you can put 
on a word to tell everybody I'm talking about this one, not any of the other ones, just this one. So the basic idea is, for example, there are uh, if I say there are five cars, the car that I'm talking about is this car. The word the tells you out of all five of these cars, I'm only talking about one, this one. If you say the teacher, the idea automatically becomes in this sentence, there is only one teacher. In this situation, there's only one teacher. That's what the word the does. From many different uh, examples of the same thing, it picks out one. Um, so when do you use it? When you need to tell the reader, this is the one that you're talking about. Or in this situation, there is only one. So like I said, Moran, someone, you don't know who. It's just a frame that you can put on a certain person. But the reader can tell who you mean by reading the rest of your sentence or the rest of your essay. Now, aside from w single words, there are also slightly longer nouns. You have, um, let's start with this one. You have sentences that can become nouns. So if we go back to this sentence, I gifted the invite to him yesterday. If you say, the fact that I gifted the invite to him yesterday, then this entire sentence after the word that all the way to the end of the sentence is one noun. This situation, this event, then becomes the subject of your sentence. So in this sentence, this is your subject. This is your verb. And this is, it's not exactly an object because the word be, the verb be is a very weird verb, but this is the rest of the sentence. So how did this complete sentence become a noun? Because I put the word that in front. It's technically correct to simply say that I gifted the invite to him yesterday is a good thing. But usually in English, uh, we're more used to seeing the fact that. So if you if this becomes a noun, it can be a subject. It can also be an object. Uh, a sentence that begins good thing simply means xing hao. Uh, Hugh, good thing I remembered, right? That I gifted the invite to him yesterday. And I should give you the complete sentence. It is a good thing that. Huh. So. I should use a different sentence. Right, so I remembered a thing. That thing is everything after the word that is the object of the sentence. So like this is a, something that you might have to use when you are editing your essay, right? If you realize that, wait, you have two complete sentences in this one sentence and you think about it, and you realize that one of those sentences is something that you're talking about. It's not the sentence. It should be part of the sentence. 
then you can use the word that to turn that sentence into a noun, either an object or a subject. The last kind of longer noun kind of thing I want to talk about is the gerund, 动名词. Usually you will see it ending in ing, right? Driving. So you might say, like driving, right? Subject, verb, and the word driving then becomes a noun is the object of the sentence. But this kind of noun is very special because you can add things onto it. It was originally a verb, which means that it could have taken an object to drive something. If you turn it into a noun like this, you can continue to add that object back onto the sentence. So originally this was simply a verb and an object. But if you want to take this and make it a noun part of the sentence, change the verb to ing, and you can carry the object with you. And it turns the entire thing into a noun. In fact, it can go even further. If your original sentence was. He drives the car, you can take this. Entire thing and by turning it into a gerund with ing, you can take the entire thing and make it part of the sentence. The original subject is he. But because there can only be one subject in a sentence, you have to change it. It becomes his. This is a grammatical English sentence. I like his driving the car. Which means the same thing as I like that he drives the car. Two different ways of saying the same thing. Uh, often in English, you will see the word of here. I like his driving of the car it simply means I like how he drives the car. So those are nouns. Do you have questions about nouns? A lot of this stuff you may not use in your own essay, but when you read essays by other people, you might come across these kinds of sentences. And you know, when you come across a more uncommon or unusual kind of sentence, you're usually not prepared for it. It's not very common. You don't see it every day. You might get confused. It might take you a few seconds to figure out what is going on. Uh, today, I just hope to give you some tools to help you uh, figure out what is going on when you come across these kinds of sentences. Um, so that you might remember that maybe this is the kind of sentence that is happening here on the page. OK, if we're done with nouns, that means we should start with verbs. And as I'm sure you remember, verbs can be a bit complicated. So the first thing to know about verbs is that there are two parts to every verb. OK, three parts to every verb. The first part is the idea. What is the action? The second part is the tense. And the third part is the aspect. In Chinese, we call this and tai. The tense, there are only three choices for tense past, present, future. 
and it tells you in relation to the entire essay, did this thing happen in the past or present or future? So this has nothing to do with the other sentences. This is in relation to the entire essay. Usually if we're talking about something that. Uh, so this kind of time is we can think of it as an objective kind of time. If you're talking about something that happened in the past, usually the whole essay will be in the past tense. If you're talking about something that is still happening, it will be in the present tense. And if you're talking about something that will or may happen in the future, it will be in the future tense. Very simple. Objective time. It's when we talk about aspects that things get complicated. An aspect tells you the relation between two sentences. A simple aspect, 简单式, just means there you can't see the aspect. It, it looks like there's only a tense. But there are three other kinds of aspects in English uh, that are common to see. The first kind is called progressive, 进行式, and it's simply telling us that in comparison with the other things in the essay, the other sentences in the essay, this thing happened for a, a, a period of time. It continued to happen. Now, I say this is in relation to the other sentences because if your entire essay is about something that took a period of time to happen, if every sentence should have an ing, then in fact, you can take the ing off of every sentence because every sentence means the same thing. Uh, so now I, I let's see if I can think of an example. So for example, if you say I was driving my car when suddenly my phone rang, the phone is not just one sound, right? It keeps ringing. But you're not using ING on the phone because in comparison to the driving, the phone ringing is a very short period of time. The driving takes longer. The, the point you're making is that while you are driving, while it is continuing, this thing happened. So the phone rang doesn't have to be the phone started ringing. It would be more correct if you said the phone started ringing. But that's not uh, what you're wanting to emphasize. So this is a relation between two sentences. Next common aspect we see is the perfect aspect has, have, had, will have the word have. Now, when do you use the perfect aspect? Like when you when you first hear about this idea, the your grammar teacher might tell you, oh, when you finish something, then you should use the word have. In Chinese, we call this one sense, right? So it seems like, okay, so if you finish it, you use this. But then the question becomes, when do I use have? And when do I use a simple past tense? And the answer again is that the word have is a relation between two sentences. When do you use have? When the fact that this is finished influences the next sentence. If uh, a friend of mine walks in and says, hey, CJ, do you want to go have lunch? Uh, or like, do you want to go eat lunch? I could say I ate. But a more precise answer is I have eaten already. 
because that influences the next sentence, which is, I'm sorry, I can't eat with you. Or maybe my friend will say, oh, OK, no problem. So I uh, or like, um, let's see. Um, let's say that uh, I drove here all the way from Kaohsiung. And I walk in and the first thing that happens is a student comes up to me and says, uh, teacher, teacher, can you please correct my essay in the next five minutes? And I could say, I just drove here from Kaohsiung. I'm very tired, maybe later. But the more precise way is, I have just driven here from Kaohsiung. The fact that I completed this action means, next sentence, I am very tired, which therefore leads to the answer, not now. I will help you later. Right, so when do you use have or had or has? When it affects the next sentence. Uh, and if there's no clear uh, effect or influence, then you can simply use a uh, simple past tense or depending on the essay, present tense, future tense. So that's the word has, have, had. Which one to use depends on your tense. If your essay, if your sentence and your essay is in the past, you would say had. If your sentence is in the present, you would say has or maybe have if it's more than one person. And if your sentence is in the future, you will say will have. So it's two different ideas. Past, present, future is the objective time of your entire essay, the tense. But whether to use simple or progressive or perfect is the aspect, the relation between sentences. Do you have questions so far? I'm pausing now because the next part will be a bit more confusing. Questions? Okay. Next, I'm going to be talking about the present, or sorry, the perfect progressive. One sentence. But before I do that, I want to point out something for you to pay attention to. So with this example sentence, walking the dog, chilioko, the first one is simple past. The objective time, the tense is past tense. There is no aspect, so it's a simple sentence. I walk the dog. It simply tells you what I did. The second sentence, I was walking the dog, still past tense, but now the aspect is progressive. It's emphasizing that I, I took some time to walk the dog or whatever I say next happened in the middle of walking the dog, right? It's continuing. But notice how I got from the first sentence to the second sentence. In the simple past tense, the one verb carries two ideas. The first idea is walking, liu. The second idea is it happened in the past. But if we add a third idea in this next sentence, the third idea is it continued. In this case, the time, the tense, and the aspect have to be put on two different words. One word, was, tells you it's in the past. The second word, walking, tells you that it continued. So it's one word for each grammar idea. The third sentence is the 
perfect progressive, 完成进行式 It follows the same pattern. One word for each grammar idea. The first idea is perfect. 完成式 So you use the word have. Sorry. Uh, you, the first idea is it's in the past. So the word have is in the past tense. Had. The second idea is perfect. So the word is is in the past participle. This is when you say like um, something like it was proven wrong. Be zhengming. Oh, hang on, I can't use that. That's a passive. I have been proven wrong. That's not right either. I can't come up with the right examples. Hang on. There we go. I have proven him wrong. 我证明他是错的 Have is perfect, and the verb has to be put in what's known as the past participle, 过去分词 to match this the pattern for the perfect aspect. So again, one word per grammar idea. Have is present tense, and proven as a past participle (PP) is perfect aspect. One word per idea. So if we go back to our perfect progressive sentence, it's also one word per idea. Had is in the past. Been is in past participle. So it it、uh, expresses the idea of perfect aspect, and then walking ing expresses the idea of progressive aspect. So it's past perfect progressive. 过去完成进行式 So the question is, what do we use this for? What is the perfect progressive used for? Again, it's a relation between two sentences, but here, the second sentence is influenced by the fact that it took me a long time or a period of time to finish doing this.、Uh, so, like, if. Uh, if my like girlfriend calls me and very angry, and she says, "I've been calling you all morning. Why didn't you pick up the phone?" I could say, "Oh, sorry, I had been walking the dog and I didn't bring my phone." So, because it took me a long time to finish this activity, therefore, when my girlfriend was calling me, I, you know, I couldn't answer. I don't have a girlfriend. It's an example. I don't have a boyfriend either.、Uh, so I had been walking the dog, or in the other example, I had been driving all the way from Gaoshong. It took me a long time.、Uh, and I'm only telling you this now because that long time has ended, and that affects the next sentence. So the good news is you probably won't need to use this kind of sentence, but if you ever read this kind of sentence, you should know this is the idea behind this sentence pattern. It took a long time to finish this action. Now remember the key idea: one word per grammar idea. So, with that in mind, you can come up with sentences like "I would have been trying to call you, but my teacher took away my phone." 
So let's start from the beginning. Would is technically the past tense of will. But here in this case, it's a kind of conditional. And it simply means uh, it was supposed to be like this, but something else happened. So this first half of the sentence is it was supposed to be, I should have been, right? I would have been, I was supposed to try to call you for a period of time. So I'm not just calling you once and not just calling you twice, but for that time period, I would have kept on calling you until you answered. Uh, but I couldn't because my teacher took away my phone. So if my teacher did not take away my phone, I would have been trying to call you all morning. Let's let's add this. All more, hang on. Now, it is, if you ever come across a sentence this complicated, please tell me because it's a very rare situation. But from this single sentence, we can have a whole picture of the situation. When I'm saying this to someone else, this sentence immediately tells us what has been going on between these two people. I would have, which means it was expected. The other person expected me to do this. But the but they did not expect me to talk to them. They expected me to call them. And to keep trying to call them. Which means that they did not expect to pick up the phone. And when I tell them this, I'm explaining why I did not do this. So I also did not expect that person to pick up the phone. So immediately you have a picture of the relationship between these two people. Uh, maybe like I am that person's assistant or like a very good friend and we like to play jokes, but it would have been expected between us for that period of time that I would keep trying to call that person and that person would not pick up and this would be normal. And the only reason that this exchange or I guess non exchange did not happen is because my teacher took away my phone. So the second part of the sentence tells us that I am a student. I have a teacher, therefore I am a student. It tells us that my teacher does not let us use our phones in the classroom. So from this one sentence, you have a very uh, rough picture of the kind of people that these three characters are, their general situation, and the, the relationship between I and you in this sentence. And it's only one sentence. This is the power of grammar. With the with a good enough sentence put in the just the right place, you can call up a, an entire world. You can conjure up people and situations and relationships, all from the grammar. Okay, do you have questions about tense and aspect? There's one more thing to tell you about verbs. Voice. Now, the these grammar words like tense, aspect, voice, progressive, perfect. These words apply to every language. But we're only talking about English. And in English, there are only two kinds of voices. Active and passive. In some other languages, like ancient Greek, they had a voice called the middle voice. 
and a, a sentence written in the middle voice does not tell you who is doing what to whom, what direction is the sentence running in. It simply presents a situation. But in English, you have to choose. Am I doing it to him or is he doing it to me? All of the examples so far have been active voice. So now let's talk about the passive voice. Remember, one word for each grammar idea. This also applies to the passive voice. In active voice, this sentence would say that my girlfriend drove me to school. But in passive voice, we switch the object and the subject. Um, although you should pay attention that in strictly speaking, in grammar rules, in this sentence, I is still the subject and uh, there is no object. But you can tell immediately who is doing what to whom. It's my girlfriend who drove me to school. So you switch the person doing the thing with the person that is affected by the thing. The verb it follows the same rule. One word for each grammar idea. Originally, it is drove, past tense, simple past tense, one idea, past. But because you have added a passive, you need another word. Was tells us it's in the past. Driven, drive, drove, driven, past participle, tells us that it is passive. So, have plus, sorry, have plus past participle is perfect. Be plus past participle is passive. Why is it called participle? Have you ever thought about this? Participle. It's a part. In Chinese, kai fen. But what, how can you separate it into parts? What does that mean? Um, English has two participles, the past participle and the present participle. The present participle you will recognize very clearly, uh, very quickly. Surprising is a present participle. And Surprised would be the past participle. Why is it called a participle? Because it can do two things at the same time. In these two sentences, the word surprising and the word surprised. Are they verbs? Are they nouns? Are they adjectives? The answer is that they are both adjectives and verbs. They play two parts. Let's look at the second sentence. I was surprised. This sentence could mean A, I am in the state of being surprised. right? This word surprised describes my mindset right now. I feel surprised. In this case, the word surprised is an adjective. But we have just learned about the passive voice. So this sentence could also mean that somebody surprised me. And in this case, the word surprised would be a verb. If you simply say, I was surprised, you can't tell the difference. 
the word surprise is at the same time a verb and an adjective. It plays two parts, so it is a participle. Uh, the same thing for the first one. It was surprise. It is a bit vague. Let's give a let's give an actual subject. The birthday party was surprising. Uh, on the one hand, it is describing the birthday party. On the other hand, it is saying that the, the party surprised me. It is both an adjective and a verb. So you can use this to help you remember. Should you use the word surprising or should you use the word surprised? I know a lot of you have this kind of problem, right? You say blah, 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 surprised, and then your teacher marks it off and writes surprising. How can you tell the difference? Remember, surprising is the thing surprises you. Surprised is the passive voice. You are surprised by the thing. So, um, when my friend suddenly showed up to my home, I was very, which one? Surprised, right? That my friend surprised me. But if I say my friend suddenly showed up at my home, it was very surprising to me. The thing surprises me. It surprised me, surprising me. Um, so grammar can also help you with these little details when you're writing. Okay, now that we have all of the elements of a verb, we can concoct extremely complicated sentences. Hang on. The give me a noun. Somebody give me a noun. Anything? Give me a noun. School? OK. The school would have been being repaired after the typhoon if it were not for the fact that everywhere was filled with students. Is a grammatically correct sentence. The sentence divides here. The main part of the sentence comes first. The second half of the sentence is a condition. It explains why the first half of the sentence uses the word would. So let's look at the condition first. It's it's slightly easier to understand. It was for the fact that means because. Uh, everywhere was filled with students, so because everywhere there were students everywhere running around. Therefore, the repairs could not continue. That's the basic idea of the sentence. 
Now it uses were not for the fact that, which means in Chinese, 要不是, right? Because of this reason, it is not. But if the grammar flips it around. If not for this, this would not have happened. So what is the main sentence? The school would have been being repaired after the typhoon. So the basic idea is clear, right? Typhoon came, school was damaged. Now the school needs to be repaired. But look at the tense. It says would have been. We talked about this. It should be like this, but it's not. And the reason is because there are too many students running around. You can't do good repairs when it's full of students. Look at the aspect. And the voice. Would have been. Being. So remember would. Uh, OK, so have. Would have. Is uh, as we just mentioned, it should be like this. Past participle of be goes with have. This tells us it is perfect. Present participle of be plus uh, be. This tells us it is progressive, is doing. And then past participle plus be tells us this is passive, right? Uh, is repaired. So this sentence is a conditional, perfect, progressive sentence in the passive voice. Why does it need to be like this? What information does this sentence give us? Would have, so it's supposed to be like this. Been being repaired tells us that it should have taken a long time. It should have, the school should have been being repaired. I'm just repeating the sentence. The repairs to the school should take a long time. So like when you walk around school for the next two or three weeks, you should still see people repairing things. But the sentence begins with the school and not the person or company that is doing the repairs. But it is repairing the school, so it's a passive voice. And so this sentence tells us that the school hired somebody and asked them to do major repairs on the school. And it was supposed it will take a long time to finish these repairs. And they should have started already because uh, the typhoon just left and they can begin immediately. But there's one thing stopping the repair company, and that is there are so many students running around, they can't do the repairs. So with one really long and complicated sentence, I can express the same idea as I just did in five simple sentences. And that is why English emphasizes clear and straightforward sentence patterns. I say five sentences, you kind of get the idea. I say this sentence, you have no idea what the fuck I'm talking about. Clear, simple ideas, clear, simple sentences make for good English writing. Uh, so this is just a basic grammar review. Grammar, as I'm sure you remember, or maybe don't remember, goes on for a lot more than just this. But these are the basic ideas that should get you through writing three and writing four. Questions? OK, I will post this video to YouTube tonight, and uh, it usually takes YouTube about a day for the automatic subtitles. So if you want to review this lesson, you can look for it on Wednesday. OK, that's it. If you don't have questions, I'll see you next week. And we'll talk about the first unit, the exposition essay.